Ladies and gentlemen, welcome or welcome back to the JKWD podcast. We get a good one for you today, but first, on the other side of this microphone is a computer, and on the other end of that computer is Calvin P. Ringgold, senior. How you doing, sir? <laughs> I'm good, because that microphone was getting dang uncomfortable, I got to tell you that. Um, <laughs> life is good, man. Uh, we got a little snow here. It was nine degrees when I woke up this morning. Ooh. There you go. And, um, it's probably 10 now. Who knows? It's It's been a few hours. But uh, life's good. And, um, you know, it snowed a little bit, but the air is clean. So, it, hey, what, what more can you ask for? Clean, cool air. Sweet. That's right. We can bypass a whole partridge in the, uh, in the pear tree thing. So, anyway, life is good. I got I got nothing to complain about. Well, your pear trees are not growing at nine degrees, so <laughs> <laughs> maybe, partridge bamboo has no place to sit. But that's a whole other thing. Yeah. Actually, it might bamboo, and and you'll get the reference when you listen to the rest of the podcast. That stuff yeah. grows everywhere. Once it's in, man, it, it's in. They actually here in Savannah was one of the first places they brought bamboo oh, really? to see okay. if it would grow here, uh, and and yeah, there's a botanical garden. Uh, you know, a little west of town that was the uh, first kind of test site where they tried to grow a few different kinds of bamboo. N- none of the none of the giant bamboo that we're talking about. But it turns out that if you accidentally transplant it somewhere, uh, it's going to grow there too. Uh, it's going to oh, grow all over. And just give it uh, some you. of the. Some of the businesses found that out uh, when oh, they, really? you know, like when strip malls went up and, yeah. you know, they, they got some planters. They're like, oh, that, that bamboo is pretty. Maybe bring a little of that over. And all of a sudden it was everywhere. Gotcha. <laughs> well, live and learn. Yep. Uh, li- live and learn and let it be too late to <laughs> take the lesson from it sometimes. <laughs> We're brought to you today by Vitamin K Daily Philosophical Supplements for your Attitude Health. Hey, I did it right. You did. Get yourself four weeks free yeah. if you go to vitaminkdaily.com and sign up now. After that, just twenty four ninety five a year, but you can wake up every day, Monday through Friday, with just a little dose of how awesome the day is going to go in your inbox. That's assuming you you wake up at a reasonable hour because I mean, they do they do go out at three thirty a.m. So sometimes. Sometimes, sometimes I'm actually, <laughs> oh, sometimes I'm actually awake when when tomorrow's comes. <laughs> yeah, happens on occasion. I, I know that I'm up too late if that happens, though. <laughs> That's okay. Sometimes I'm up when that happens, and I'm up too late then too. <laughs> so, yeah. oh, vitamin K showed up. I better go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah. we got so anyway. A- that's, that's vitaminkdaily.com. Get yourself four weeks free, uh, and and now yeah, we can talk a little bit about our guest today. Go, go ahead, I think we should gonna, do that. Yeah, that's a really cool guest today. Yeah, Candace we had Willie. great conversation. Yeah, uh, Candace Willie is is a is a uh, can I say ball of awesome? Is that is that an insult? It's, a, it's okay know. with me. Okay, uh, hopefully it's okay with her. Uh, she was a she was a. Teen mom, and uh, when she got divorced at 19 uh, with two kids, her uh, becoming ex husband uh, told her that she'd be nothing but a welfare mama, and now she's um, now now she's gone past the um, you know top top sales uh, thing. At, at a <laughs> national retailer and, yep. and is now teaching the next wave of, of top sellers. Uh, and she's also a, a resilience coach uh, in her spare time, <laughs> um, which, which I guess COVID has allowed for, for a little extra of, but uh, yeah, we, we talk about resilience. We talk, wow, everything, everybody came up to, we talked about Tony Robbins and Fred Astaire and Stephen Covey, and uh, we got we got and all over the place. You get fur and earth through. You're going to learn a new word too. Yeah. It's true. Yep, uh, we talked about bamboo. Wait for and that. Dogs you'll and you'll recognize it when you hear it. some other stuff too. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, go ahead and 
give it a listen. We'll play some music. And on the other side, you'll hear Candace Willie. So how, how are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you. Good. Crazy, we're finding crazy you, um, Friday. We, we're finding you uh, like locked down hard wherever you are. I, I mean, yeah. So we're in Salt Lake and um, not too bad. I would share that um, as you look across the country, this is one of those areas that really hasn't had much impact. So we actually were never fully co- quarantined. Obviously pieces like masks and whatnot are in mm-hmm. place, but but nothing um, too drastic. But we're, you managed we, to we, escape that? We did. So um, I'm from Utah, and we moved back here about two years ago. We were in Chicago for almost um, four years and happy to be back home. But I look at Chicago, and I'm, I'm happy that I'm yeah. not there. Yeah, good time to... Good time to be where you are instead of back there. Yep. Yes. hundred yeah. <laughs> percent. I don't think I want to be in Chicago for anything. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not right there. now. It is very <laughs> cold there. Yes. We managed to be there for the, you know, polar vortex that occurred. But, oh, yeah. um, mm. you know, a few months later we, we were out. I mean, it's interesting to see what, you know, negative 26 is. Yeah. <laughs> In a brick house. It's uh, <laughs> cold. It's cold. Yeah. yeah. Very cold. I was in um, Fairbanks, Alaska for back when I was in the Air Force. Oh, and it would yeah. get like 60 below there. I was there in March. It's crazy. And I'm like, okay, I, we never need to go back here again as long as we live. Not in the winter. <laughs> e- ever, ever again. My son's in the military. He's shared a few places they've been. So just- <laughs> what, what branch? So he is a scout sniper in the Marines. He instructs. He's in Jacksonville, North Carolina. He's in the Marines. I, yeah. I didn't do that because I didn't think I'd make it through basic training to take <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, the Marines. Yeah. I had a couple of, I had a couple of friends that went to the Marine Corps. I'm like, eh, I'm going to go with the Air Force. That, you know, I like the blue, that blue outfit they got. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to fly. Yep. So, you know, interesting. So I, I would share that with you because, you know, my son has guns. So just be careful. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Um, no problem. I'm not going to tell you where I am in the country. Just just to let you know. Yeah. Well, yeah, don't share. I would I don't share at all. But, you know, that's not the point of these these discussions. But yeah, where are you guys at? Uh, I'm in Savannah, Georgia. Awesome. I'm in Syracuse, New York. It's, oh. It was nine degrees when I got up this morning. So. I was just going to say, you, you can't say Chicago's cold. It's cold <laughs> there too. Yeah, yeah, but Chicago got that crazy wind too. That's that's great. The, so the lake. The yeah, lake the, effect. The lake's closer. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. I learned that, you know, one of the, those long puffy coats um, that everybody wears in the Northeast that mm-hmm. I swore I would never have. I think within like two weeks, I was, you know, state, the, the <laughs> state puff marshmallow girl. I was like, I'm getting one of those long things, those sleeping bag things with fur on it. So, yep. yeah. I yep. totally Absolutely. Awesome. Well, I appreciate oh, you guys cool. having me on your show. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for coming. Normally what we do is we start by asking you to introduce yourself to our audience and then, uh, Tell us your mission and why it's your mission. Awesome. So I am Candace Van Heel and um, known on social media as well as my podcast is Candace Willie, which is my first and middle name. Mm-hmm. And I would share with you guys that my mission since um, launching my own podcast or my own efforts on social media really is around um, utilizing my superpower, which is resilience and helping people overcome adversity. I was a teenage mom and a single mom for a lot of years. And, you know, I was that person hell bent on proving everybody wrong and want to help others um, in similar circumstances um, find their way and find success, which for me equates to happiness. Awesome. Uh, How did you come about this? I mean, obviously, 
you, you found yourself in, you know, a tough spot young, mm-hmm. but how do you work your way out of it and stick with it? Yeah, it's a great question. So I would share that I had my daughter at 15 before I could even drive and was married by the time that um, I was almost 17. And I would share that by 19 with two young children, I was going through a divorce. And for me, it really came from the catalyst for me was um, the night I received my divorce papers and sitting in my one bedroom apartment with my beautiful children, my daughter in my bed, in my bed sleep and my infant son in the borrowed bassinet really looking at the two of them and going, I have absolutely no damn idea what this is going to look like, but I am going to do the very best I can. Um, And that really was the catalyst for me is it really became about them. And I know everybody today talks about their why. Um, Before I really knew what that meant, they were my why. Great. Did you, uh, we were just talking about this actually, before you show up, did you have proof of resilience proof of success before you uh, set about you know, making your way then? I I think that, you know, listening to my mom speak about my personality when I was younger, I was that child that you told me no, and I would figure out a way to do it. So I, I would say that, yes, that yeah. that resilience was to some degree innate. Um, My mom used to actually say, you're like a cat, no matter how high you drop you from, you land on your feet. Um, (laughs) So, so (laughs) I'm cat like, didn't know that about me, but um, I I would share that. Yes. I do think that there are some pieces, pieces of that, that are personality um, based for sure. What do you think? What? Who's going first? Go ahead. Chicken. Go ahead, Kevin. Um, Re- resiliency is a, is an interesting art in science. I um I don't know if I'm as good at being resilient as I am uh, not letting it get to me in the first place. Um, I I'm I'm not bragging about this, and I, I don't know that I've that I've had what I would consider to be really incredible hardships. Uh, but then again, some of the stuff I've been through, I've seen other people just dry up and, and blow away with. So, you know, part of that mindset is I, I've got, I'm, I go kind of neutral. I don't do this a lot, you know? Yeah. Um, but I call that positive um, intelligence. <laughs> I, let me write that down. I like that. <laughs> I, I call positive that intelligence positively. Um, uh, I'm good at helping other people sometimes when they allow me to see that maybe, maybe it's not quite as bad as you think it is. Right. But um, I've seen, I've seen people, I've known people who have come from incredible uh, hardships and come up and, uh, and it's all of a sudden they're, they're bouncing around the world and life is good. And I'm like, how did you, how did you do that? I don't know that I could do that. So uh, in, in one regard, I am so happy that I have not actually been tested. Not, right. not to the full extent that, that the universe can test you. Uh, maybe I did that in another life and they, and they figured out I passed that time. So <laughs> I'm okay Take that with. off the life list. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm good for that. How about you, Josh? So I, you know, the way my mom tells the story is, is uh, growing up, if I rolled in mud, I'd come out clean. <laughs> well, my younger brother could go in the bath and come out dirty. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's good. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, well, I was you know, generally lucky and things came easy to me. He had to work for everything. Uh, and yeah, I, I found that I, you know, I had problems when I got to college and actually had to do the work because, you know, school was easy for me. Extracurriculars were easy for me. Uh, standardized tests were easy for me. Uh, so I just, I, I cruised through, you know, 17 and a half years. And then, um, my, my brother, meanwhile, you know, had to work for everything. Uh, he, yeah, he's dyslexic. He, you know, had to, you know, reading was a struggle for him. Um, but he's now off, uh, yeah, he's teaching college. He's, um, he's scoring films. He's, uh, 
taken a master's as the college said, Hey, you're teaching, you can go to, why not? <laughs> um, yeah. and so, so he's really worked for what he's got and now he's really excelling. Uh, as an adult, I had to start manufacturing adversity for myself. I, you know, become a distance runner and that kind of thing. So, um, I've had to, I've had to set myself up with occasions where I could fail so that I, I can, <laughs> you know, I can work to succeed at them. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's that, it's that adversity piece, right? Yeah. Like it is how do you see past it and how do you keep working? My son was very much like you in school and, um, in the sense that it came easy to him. And, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because I think military that he chose military life. Um, I'm like for somebody who, who was in his own right mind, like in control of school and all the things that impacted him and things were easier. It's interesting that he chose military. Cause I, I don't think those two are married up. <laughs> no, no. In fact, in fact, never, I, you never know. Yeah. Yep. You never know. Yeah. I really had to, had to not do something. I don't, I don't take orders well. <laughs> yeah. Um, you I don't even take suggestions. Well, no, I, I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, I, I still don't know how he and I work together. I really don't. <laughs> I think it's that's fantastic. And when I think about, you know, the other thing that what you guys are talking about makes me think about is attachment. Because I think that's the other piece of being resilient is your ability to let go. You know, yes. are, are, is your identity, have you connected your identity to a relationship or a job or something that's materialistic that, that you can't let go of that's holding you back? And, right. and I do think that's another skill that I, I haven't attached myself. Um, matter of fact, my greatest opportunity is being present because I'm always forward look, thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, but because of that, I don't look back. So, so I think there's a piece of attachment that goes with resilience. How's your, how's your <laughs> presence? I mean, mm -hmm. you, you talked about looking, looking forward and not looking back. How are you with, with staying now and being here? Are you, are you mm -hmm. constantly thinking about what's next? Or are you able to kind of hang in there? So my daughter went through and as um, Calvin, you were sharing um, the piece around hardships, right. And mm -hmm. the things that you go through and that cause you to pause in life and really reconsider. I would tell you, I was not aware that I wasn't present and that I was so forward thinking until my daughter went through a, a severe addiction. And, you know, I ended up in a place where I ended up with clinical depression. Didn't even know I like literally was in denial. I'm like, I'm not depressed and then cried. Right. <laughs> um, cause I, I, I had lost my mom and my daughter grieving my daughter that was still alive, but obviously going through, um, the severe addiction and it put me in a place where it was like, um, the doctor, basically the cognitive doctor basically said, you can either a, um, get some counseling, B practice some mindfulness or C work, the, work with the counselor to, um, medicate. And based off my daughter's situation, medication was not something that was even an option for me. And I started with a counselor and the counselor advised me on yoga and meditation, mm -hmm. started with medication and meditation. And really that's when I recognized that I wasn't present. And today, um, a few years later, I, I have a regular practice where I, I meditate every, every single day. Um, and, and I do yoga five to seven days a week. So, um, I am doing much better, but it is something I, I fight constantly. What does your meditation practice look like? So I have an empower hour every morning. So, um, first of all, I split my phones. And what I mean by that is I have a personal phone and I have a work phone. And that was my first part of my being able to connect, um, or disconnect, um, from, being pulled into things that distract me. So I wouldn't get up in the morning and look immediately at my work phone and see email and become reactive. So my empower hour, I get up, I, I don't look at email. I get my tea and I go up to my meditation space and it's a minimum of 10 minutes to 30 minutes before I start my day. I journal with some intentions of what do I want to accomplish today? 
Um, and, and then, you know, visualization is huge for me. So I, I obviously, um, my, my journal actually, I do a lot of, um, clipping from Pinterest so I can envision the things that I'm working towards. Um, and, and again, not long, um, far out, uh, things that I'm working towards, but more immediate. Um, and then I, during the day, I would tell you that I am that person that will stand up from my desk, shut things off and make sure I'm breathing. Cause that's the other part for me is if I get stressed, I stop breathing. So, or stop I hold breathing. I, yeah, I hold my breath. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. I haven't so, tried that one. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> Not unless you have someone around <laughs> that can, that can uh, check on you. Oh, interesting. <laughs> I did notice that I breathe very slow and, and shallowly. I was looking at that the other day. Your breath's like, you know, breathe in. And I'm like, no, I don't do that. My breath is, is there. I know it's there. I'm feeling it. But it's like, I have no reason to like super charge to you know, jump off a building or something. So yeah. I'm still alive. So I guess I'm doing all right. Great. You know, well, and you can so, tell where your stress sits in your body too, based off of it. So we all tend to tense in our shoulders mm-hmm. and and some of that will tell you if, if you're breathing deeply, <laughs> still breathing, I should say. <laughs> so now that we know that um, resilience is your superpower, mm-hmm. how did you figure that out? So I think I've always known, and that goes back to just being prideful and driven. I would share with you that Going back to when, as I shared with you before, going back to that being at 19 years old and recognizing that I had to live a different life than most 19-year-old girls or women would have to live with two children, um, an infant and a four-year-old, is I I just was so determined initially to prove people wrong. So I think my resilience started there. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think the Fred Astaire quote is, um, the, the greatest revenge is outrageous success. And that used to kind of play in my head. It's like, I will prove, you know, my, my ex-husband, um, last thing he said to me as he packed his last box out of the house is you'll always and forever be a welfare mama. And I was like, Oh, I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think it, you know, some of it was pride and, um, ego. So I think I've always known, but I think what I thought it was that was driving me at that time, I didn't necessarily have a word for, Um, And have recognized over the years that um, when those obstacles are in place, um, and 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 I'm also, I would also share, I'm a person that I I am more challenged in those situations and I like the mental stimulation of having to problem solve. So I think those two go together. So very, no, (laughs) I just called Josh. (laughs) (laughs) My my niece is is five years old and they diagnosed her with uh, with something that that is usually diagnosed in teenagers, it's called oppositional defiant disorder. Um, I might have had that. That's the. That's the <laughs> um, it, it sounds a lot like uh, like like what you have. Yeah, you know, I yeah, I know my first my initial reaction to hey, you should is. No, <laughs> uh, that's the nice version. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, um, and it, it sounds like that's a, <laughs> a, a thing in your, in your life. The, the worst thing somebody can tell you is that you're um, going to fail or that you shouldn't do something. Cause <laughs> I, yep. Cause that's not my vocabulary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. And would fight it to tooth and nail. <laughs> So how did you end up transitioning to coaching? So I would share. So I, in my day job, um, I work for Ulta Beauty and um, I am a director of field training and education. So um, I was an operator for years. Um, I was a district manager for almost 25 years. So I very stimulated by um, making money and telling people what to do. And and now I teach people how to make money and tell people what to do. Um, So I I think for me, um, people have always, I realized my early on what you can accomplish with others and, and 
that with that and being a leader of a business, um, even though it wasn't my own business, um, I always was problem solving, coaching, leading, um, and 25 years of that under my belt prior to stepping into this HR role that I've been in for now four years. So I do it in my day job and I, and I, and I want to continue to do that, um, in a, in a different format outside of work. Cause I think at work, it's all leadership and it's all operations and processes and, and it isn't where I get to come out, you know, talk about my daughter's addiction. It isn't where I get to talk about being a mom at 15 or going through divorces or things that we know go on outside of work that directly correlate with what's happening at work. I also think that I spend a lot of time around helping people try to understand that your values at work and your values personally shouldn't be different. So they really should align. And I think a lot of people spend their entire lives or adult lives fighting that internal battle of how do you bring those together? How did you find the transition to teaching? I, so I want everybody to be their best because I, first of all, we're all our best when we're happy. And Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean, I, I mean, I, I truly believe you have to have the ebb and flow of good and bad in your life to recognize when you are happy or when, when you've accomplished joy or those things that make you feel good. So, you know, I think for me, it, it was truly trying to help people achieve that for themselves. I've also, because I didn't want to be judged early on. I mean, there were people that were like, hmm, you know, a girl, two kids, like, you know, I don't judge people. I look at them and go, I want you to be the very best you version of you, not version of me or anybody else, but version of you. So it came pretty natural because of that piece. Yeah. Cause and yeah, that's a big change from I'm going to, I'm going to do this and, and prove people wrong and, and tell people what to do to stepping back and really letting it be about, your students and and outside of work and in more of a coaching environment about your clients instead of about you. Well, and I think the other piece too is, is we all go through that pivotal time in our lives where it becomes less about money. So, right. you know, I, I think that would, that also certainly would lend to it. Cause I, I mean, that 19 year old girl, a dollar an hour, a dollar more an hour meant being able to pay for my, you know, my own daycare or rent or, you know, to come off of those programs that assisted me in helping elevate me. Mm -hmm. Um, So then it was about money. Um, And then I think that, you know, to your point, that transitional piece also probably occurred a bit when I was like, okay, I'm at a financially stable place that now it can be because I love it and I am passionate about it versus it being about my finances. I got to eat next week. Yeah. Maslow was alive and well in, in life. Yeah. What would you, I don't know, goofy questions. What would you imagine is your, whether you want to talk about your coaching life or, just, well, your whole res- resiliency practice would be to date, um, your greatest win? I, my greatest win above all else is just being okay with me. So I, if it's, you know, when you're that person that lives out in front, if it's mm-hmm. no matter what you're working towards is I am so happy and truly grateful for where I'm at right now mm-hmm. that all those other things are awesome. And, you know, if if I accomplish them, fantastic, but it's just being happy and good where I am. If it's my physical state, you know, and, and honestly, if it's my weight, how I look, if it's my job, if it's what other people think of me, my relationship with my husband or my relationship with my kids, I I think the thing I'm most proud of and relish the most in is I'm just okay now. And, and, and at what point in your life did you connect with that? It is when I found mindfulness. <laughs> so there, there, <laughs> there was a direct correlation between. Okay. True enough. I, I'm, I, cause again, I, I think that, and the other piece too, is I, I think life as a whole, and I'm sure you guys can relate to this, right? Like life's just demanding and, and we're being pulled in so many directions. If it's, you know, kids work. I, I, it just, 
we get caught up in the action of things. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's that pause to go, am I being purposeful in what I'm doing? And am I eliminating all the other crap? Like, all the things that don't matter. So, and not letting that control me. That's a, you, eliminating the stuff that doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. That's a magical, that's a magical skill. And I know a lot of people who like e everything matters. So from all the stuff, I mean, I've listened to the stuff that's happening in your life. You're probably going to say mindfulness again, but how did you get to the point? And this is for the audience mm -hmm. where you decided what really mattered. Yeah. So the reason that's such a fantastic question is because it was, I think the mindfulness helped me get there, but what really mattered to me is recognizing when I lost my mom or lost my daughter, which she's back two years of sobriety. Um, yay. <laughs> um, but it was six years. It was six years that she went through her battle, um, but started with op opioid use. Um, but I, I would share with you the two things in those two losses that made me recognize it is my mom and I did not always have a great relationship. And I was just disappointed that by the time we did, I had wasted all of that time. And with my daughter, my, my daughter is the girl I didn't like in high school. And what I mean by that is she's very dramified. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, I she would call me and I'd be at work and she'd start to tell me this story. And I'd be like, oh my God, can you bottom line me? Like, I'm working. <laughs> like, give me the bottom. And and I what I realized is if I did that, she started over, which was never a good thing. <laughs> but six years, but honestly, six years into her addiction, I'm like, I I want that call. Mm -hmm. And I want to listen. And once I worked through all the emotion of my role in her addiction, I, I was able to get to the my my only regret in any of it or or piece I wish I could have changed was when I had the chance to spend time with her or more meaningful time with her that I'm all high dog. Sorry, guys. Um, I got the same thing going on over yeah, here. You got a dog. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm like in the middle <laughs> of my answer. <laughs> so the the most... I wasn't spending the time with her that I wish I had. Of. And I, and I always told myself, if she gets clean and I get a chance to do this over that I know doesn't mean she won't relapse. Doesn't mean she won't use again, but I will be present and I will be a part of her life. So that those two situations made me think about every interaction, every commitment that I've had and, and where my personal values and professional values would line up. Where did you identify your personal and professional values? Is there a specific exercise you've done? Uh, how did you evaluate that and those? So I would I would share that there is a book out there called Water the Bamboo, and it's uh, Water the Bamboo um, by Greg Bell, and he oh, also has yes. okay yes such such an excellent author and speaker. Um, I would tell you that I went through a, a meet, I was in a meeting and that was shared as a recommendation and I watched his Ted talk and was hooked about the book. And he takes you through an exercise to really identify how you marry those two up. So that was really the resource and tool that I used for that. That's awesome. You know, I have, I only heard that bamboo story analogy probably month, month and a half ago. And I was like, how could I possibly be as old as I am teaching motivation and, and self uh, mastery and not have heard that story? I, well, I haven't heard that story and I'm guessing there are you know, <laughs> members of our audience who might not do, do too well. Oh, well, please. Tag team it. Go for it. Take care of it. No, shoot. No, you got it. Go ahead. Tell us, <laughs> tell us the bamboo story. <laughs> So um, giant bamboo, it, it is, it takes actually two years. Um, so, so Greg speaks to 
to focusing on what matters most and how do you how do you truly cultivate that and and he uses the example of the bamboo so giant bamboo obviously it once you plant it it takes 2 to 3 years to to grow to the surface okay. and it really is about being patient and how the farmers utilize that land prior to it it achieving um, obviously it's harvest and then it can grow up, you know, to, I think it was 60 to 80 feet within just days of obviously hitting the surface. So it's that really whole notion of being patient as the seed is growing. Once it hits the surface, how it blossoms into something quickly. I'm going to have to get me a picture of bam- giant bamboos just to keep that, just to keep that in mind. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's and and again, great book. Um, multiple exercises in the book, in terms of how you bring it into life. And the other piece I appreciate about his book is it's not just finding it yourself; it's how to integrate it into your life. So, how do you integrate it into the philosophy that you have in your marriage, or with your family, or your work team? And and really, how do you get everybody? that you surround yourself with in alignment with those pieces, but also being, co- you know, cognizant of the elements that are important to them at the same time. So I would also say that adds a, t- a ton of value. And so it's, it's really a, an analogy that aligns with the you know, 10 years to overnight success. That it seems like you came from nowhere, but you've been working so hard that <laughs> on, on stuff that nobody saw. And then all of a sudden you're everywhere. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. Very, very aligned with that. As your, your career, your, your day job yeah, has progressed. Have you found that the shifts you have to make there also shift in your, not only your coaching, but your, your personal life? Yes, you know, it's what I what I value about you asking this question is, you know, I took my team through an exercise um, a couple of years ago, and um, I pulled it off of the internet as I was searching for icebreakers. And you know, the exercise really is where it's like a a life life career map. And if you look and you literally said, okay, I'm going to do here's the line in the middle, and I'm going to chart the highs and lows of my personal life. Mm -hmm. And if it's, you know, you know, had a hard time in personal life, went through a divorce, moved out, doing better, lost weight, went up, you know, and and then did the exact same thing with a separate line and graphed how, how you obviously progress through your career um, or what's happening in your work. And it's very interesting to see where the sweet spot, because the, the places where the lines meet up are where we find that greatest sense of joy in our lives. So, you know, we're always, and I know people talk about work-life balance. There's no such thing. I mean, the truth is there's time it's when work requires more, your, your personal life requires less or vice versa. But when you talk about that true sense of happiness or success, it, it was pretty amazing, not just for myself, but everyone on my team where you, you found that like, oh my gosh, my life it, you know, it's that crossroad of my life is in a good place right now. And so is my professional life, but, mm. but recognizing also how you behave or how you're impacted when they're offset. That's a great that's exercise. A, that, yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a deep exercise. I, I need to, I need to do that one for sure. Um, <laughs> you, you use a word on your website that, that tickles me in one regard and kind of excites me in another. And you use the word, Accelerate. <laughs> yep. <laughs> my word, my word, accelerate. So it, to me, acceleration really is where you're taking and you're motivated by achieving that success and ultimately how you put that into action. So it really is that combination of um, what are you trying to achieve in success and then, and, and really having it all the way. Mm-hmm. Um, I also think we, we tend to think I'm going to be happy when I get over here, or I'm going to find success when I'm over over there. And I, I think the part and the beauty of acceleration or accelerate is that we are already there. And, and when we have that synergy or that energy within us, it, it makes it, it just, you move so much quicker and faster and, and with more fulfillment. 
So awesome. I'm glad you like that word. I like that I like word. I like that word a lot. Yeah. <laughs> if I use it, I, I can I can I'll, I'll reference. You know, I'll, I'll I'll give you credit for it. Right? <laughs> Ten years from now, I'll see it somewhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, maybe maybe as early as next week. You never know. That's, right. <laughs> that, that, that's true. I'm waiting. I give credit where of- it's due. That's, <laughs> you know, one of one of the things I've always loved to do in my life is when somebody does something uh, to make sure that they know who did it, who said it where I got it from, because I've been in so many situations where people just like to steal ideas and and Mm -hmm. pawn it off as theirs. And I'm like, no, if I learn this from this guy, he needs to get the props or or this lady or, or this military fellow. Um, And I, I love one of the things I love giving credit. I love finding stuff I can tell people about that other people are doing. So it's, uh, it's it's wonderful. So I love giving credit. <clears throat> like I tell You're, him, he he keeps me straight. He uh he gets me to give him my permission. And then yeah. the first time he needs to use that skill, he'll ask me if it's okay. And after that, he just rolls his eyes. <laughs> and then no, you know, it, sometimes I have to turn him off. <laughs> yeah. I mean, turn him off. Turn, turn him off down. the Josh the Josh washer did today. Yeah. <laughs> but it's good. Um, so speaking of giving credit, uh, you've, you've overcome some hurdles, uh, not only emotional ones, but financial ones. And it uh, sounds like you didn't have a great relationship with your mom for a while. Uh, first husband, not, not so good a model how did you model your your climb into success? Where did you where did you pull your examples from? Who did you learn from along the way? Yeah. So I would share that really my my learnings came from three different places. One, um, I I thank my mom and my dad for um I do feel like they were great examples in the sense of they worked hard. Um, you know, I also, I think my work ethic certainly comes from them a hundred percent. I also think that they gifted me with common sense, which I'm very thankful for because <laughs> I think that, um, you know, I, I was aware of what was coming, coming at me. Cause I think, you know, I obviously being a teenage mom and, and I mean, I, took my daughter to school with me, you know, education or a formal education at, at that time in my life was not an option. Um, I leaned heavily into, um, reading resources. So we didn't obviously have the internet back then. Um, you know, I took my kids to the library. I read, um, if it was getting a, you know, how to complete a resume for dummies book. I did. So I, I really leaned into resources, um, knowing that it was something that I could learn, but I would say the, the, the third and probably the most impressionable above all else was modeling the behavior of my mentors. And, you know, I, I do feel like I was, I read people fairly easy and, I do think that that was helpful for me because I could see those individuals pretty quickly who I needed to emulate or wanted to get on their coattail. Um, and, and that really obviously helped me move quickly, um, especially in my professional career. I was a district manager at 24 years old. And I mean, at 24, I wouldn't have given my keys to my car to my kids. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, or, or my checkbook, you know, it's like, and I was running, they gave me the opportunity to run multi-million dollar businesses at 24 without a formal education. And did I work hard for that? Um, absolutely. And was I willing to go up and beyond, which is that work ethic that I got from my parents, but I learned quickly and I observed. So mentors, <laughs> find your mentor. <laughs> uh, so did you find your mentors mainly in your work then mm-hmm. yes. within your company? Yeah. Yep. Well, and I, I would say within my company and the written word, I mean, I, you know, that's the other piece with my kids that I'm very proud of. They, they read to this day. I couldn't afford to do much. Um, so our vacations or our entertainment were, I mean, they still love to read. We would read together. So that was, that was our entertainment. What are um, maybe three books that 
that really shaped uh, the the best parts of you? Um, well, I so when I go back, and it's an oldie but a goodie, but um, Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits, I would absolutely say to this day, I still recommend the book. <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. it, it, it is such a fundamental um, piece of who I am. Um, so absolutely um, utilize that as a leadership book. Um, I think Kenneth Blanchard um, is another author, and there's so many of of his books that um, The Heart of a Leader is an excellent book that's out there that actually pulls in a bunch of the scenarios that he's utilized from other, uh, that come from other books. Um, so he was a author that I certainly um, referenced quite a bit. Um, and and then I would say probably more personally relationship oriented or even spiritually. I, I love Oprah. Her, her favorite book of mine today is where she pulled in, um, you know, what I know for sure is actually the title. And if you, follow her at all in all of her magazines or articles that she's done over the years. She, that was kind of her thing, what I know for sure. And this book actually pulls all of those um, philosophies together. So, um, you know, she's, she's at at the core, probably that person that um, I connect to heart, you know, so those there's authors that you connect to mind and she is absolutely the person I connect to from a heart perspective. She's been through a lot. A lot. <laughs> and she's just so incredibly relatable. And, you know, um, I, I that's what I love about, I, I mean, I loved about her show back when she had her show, all the books. And I mean, today, even her own channel um, and Super Soul Sunday, I, I just, I just appreciate that she's a person and, and, you know, I've never seen her as a person with ego. So, so you teaching resilience have you ever almost quit? I mean, you were right there. I'm going to, I'm not doing this crap anymore, whatever that was. Tell us about that point and coming out of it. Yeah. So that is such a, an honest, <laughs> so when I, I think about that moment for me, mm-hmm. that raw moment for me where you're like, I don't know if I can do this. Um, I, I know exactly when it was because it was um, in 2007, I had accepted a job um, that required me to relocate. And I was so excited. I'm like, this is going to be such a great opportunity. Um, I it was moving me from Denver to Los Angeles and, you know, I had earlier that year purchased, well, about a year prior, had purchased a townhome. Mm-hmm. And if you guys remember, 2007 was when the economy bottomed out specifically in housing. Yep. Um, I had purchased a loft in Denver that made me house poor, um, was a terrible financial decision. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had gone through a divorce. I was <laughs> going to show the world that I could rebound from my divorce. I was going to have this awesome place in Denver. Um, bought a new car that again, I couldn't afford. And, you know, I was on top of the world in this job and thinking I'm taking a new job and I relocated and my relocation package allowed me for 30 days of housing in California. And then obviously they supported like a realtor to help you try to sell your house. Well, I couldn't sell my house and, or the loft. And, there went as about six months. I was robbing Peter to pay Paul because I, I mean, I couldn't afford to live in Los Angeles and pay rent where I was at and then pay a mortgage in Denver as the housing economy was falling apart. And my realtor suggesting short sell, we still couldn't sell it. There was a lot of new real estate nearby. And again, just people couldn't qualify for loans that they creatively had qualified previously. Um, With that, it put me in a position of foreclosure and um, with all of the juggling of my finances, if it was, I would take and pay this, this credit card so I could pay the house payment on the credit card, just trying to, to, to keep my head above water. I was financially drowning and I had worked so incredibly hard to build my credit, to be financially stable, that that moment of like losing what I considered to be everything that mattered, that goes back to that attachment piece, Mm -hmm. 
I, I was devastated. I, I was like, you know, I, I literally had a moment where it's like, is this even worth it? Like, and, and it had me questioning my job, my career. It's like, you know, I, it, and I had to end up, fighting, I actually ended up not only foreclosing, but I had to file bankruptcy because of it. Um, you know, of course, going back that, that at that point in time, that was awful for me. I, and, and to me kind of defined who I was as a person and, and working past that moment and not just getting through it, but that was probably the closest that I've ever come to just feeling like, you know what, life's just not worth this. And I don't know if I can keep doing this. It's a great question. Thank you. But you did. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, the, the follow-up was, was, how did you, you know, how, how did you decide to keep going? I, I made a new plan. So I, I would share that I ended up actually leaving the job in California and, um, I ended up moving back home, um, to Utah and pursued a different professional opportunity, but allowed me to be near family and a support system that, um, made it easier for me to, I didn't move back in with my parents, but moved to, um, Salt Lake where I had obviously my parents to help support with my kids. Um, you know, I would say that that was probably the biggest piece is, is, you know, obviously having a, in a, a support system helps, but, but also not being afraid to say, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. And, and letting it go. So it was disappointing to have to walk away from the job opportunity, but it was the right thing for me to do to get back on my feet. Yeah, we've, we've, we've had conversations from time to time on <clears throat> when is it quitting and when is it you've just decided that this is not the best option for you and you need to move on? That's one of Josh's great questions on, on podcasts. And a lot of people don't know how to make that determination. Mm -hmm. When is it, when was, when was it just a bad idea or when is it I'm being lazy? I'm not confident with me. Um, I'm just not going to put myself through this anymore. How do you help people make that kind of decision choice? Yeah. Or analogy? Yeah. Well, and I'm sure you guys are asking or having this conversation quite a bit right now. Cause I think um, what COVID or current state has led us to is a lot of people that are in this position, right? If it's, it, you know, their job situation or honestly, even being, being isolated away from people and not finding the things that normally bring us happiness. So, you know, I, I think that, that's where you have to, and this is where that kind of that intersection of understanding professionally and personally and what's most important. And this is how we kind of keep our self reserve in place is, is recognizing that no matter what you decide, you still have you. And, you know, it, it the decisions aren't going to be easy to make. It, it's understanding your pros and cons. It's like, you know, I, again, I don't think there's ever a perfectly right answer for any of us, but it truly is sitting down and, and self-reflecting enough to say, this is what's important to me. This isn't what's important to me. And if I do this, what's the win? And then what's the opportunity and trying to make a decision based off of the best scenario, knowing that neither one of them might be, I may, may not be ideal or even the third option may not be ideal. So it's just giving yourself that, giving yourself the, the grace to know you have options. And that's the gift right there is that, is that you have an option. Thank you. You guys are really making me think here. He's, he's, <laughs> he's got, he's got that. What am I going to say next? <laughs> well, no, I, I think this is the first time that we've uh, actually interviewed, maybe the second time we've actually interviewed anyone who was, you know, admittedly a resilience coach. Um, I think, I, I don't know if they're hard to find or not. Maybe I'm just not looking and maybe I don't need that because I know enough about me, but resilience is people's entire self images are tied up in the resilience piece. And, um, you know, should I be able to recover from this? Should I be able to recover from that? Am I just a loser? You know, and going through those things with people, I mean, it's, it's tense. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, as a coach, you don't, you never tell them, of course, you, I mean, that's not the job to tell them. They have to bring out this answer from inside them. And that's a, that's a challenging place to be in life. Um, so I, I don't know if I could ask you what your toughest case was. That's probably a, a weird kind of thing, but you're, I was going to say, I was going to ask you your best advice, but I think you just gave it to it. You got to know yourself. <laughs> People getting to know themselves is tough. Yeah, it is really tough. And, you know, it's interesting because you, you kind of spawned a thought for me when you said like, who's been your toughest person to help or influence or guide. And I mean, ultimately it all resides with us, but I'll tell you the hardest person for me to influence has been my daughter. And, cool. you know, it's, I, I just like the pause when you said that, cause I'm like, I get so frustrated cause I'm like, man, I could help her. She'd just let me like, I, I, and she won't. She, so, so, so much of helping people is them letting you help them. And, you know, I do think that when somebody seeks advice, if it's, you know, if it's that you're just asking because you're a friend or, or you respect someone's opinion or you're hiring somebody to help you or however you're approaching it, it's first that willingness mm -hmm. to ask for help and being vulnerable. I, I've never been a person to say I have all the answers because I certainly don't, never will. Am I going to make mistakes? Absolutely. And, and, you know, the beauty of it is I know I'll survive at the end of it mm -hmm. um, based off of what I've gone through. But my daughter, my daughter, I get frustrated all the time because I'm like, oh my gosh, like I just wish she would let me help her. <laughs> she won't. I, I'm like the one person there. that, <laughs> that, you know, I'm on the outside for her. So yeah. even though we're closer than we've probably ever been and, you know, she's gone through so much and I, I'm so proud of her and what she's been able to work through, she just won't let me in. A parent's place. <laughs> Just on the outside of the door. Yeah, I find out. Uh, I find the older I get, the the smarter my parents get. <laughs> yep, <laughs> that's a t-shirt. I think that's don't, a t-shirt. Don't let them hear that. Right back. <laughs> well, we can't let them hear any of the podcast, yes. <laughs> <laughs> my dad was like, "What's a podcast?" <laughs> I'm like, "Dad, it's kind of like old sports, you know, radio sports." talk radio yeah but for computers no oh yeah. god oh, awesome so speaking of podcasts tell us about yours uh what you know tell us not only about it but uh why you decided to start it and and that kind of thing because i think that's something mm -hmm. that a, a lot of people are thinking about you know, so, <laughs> 10 months since a COVID here. <laughs> COVID here. So um, I would share with you that um, moving back to Chicago or moving back to like from Chicago for me was the initial catalyst. So I used to volunteer with a few organizations there that helped um, single moms, young moms, um, a, a, a large organization called Dress for Success that really helps women, um, you know, acclimate or um, it's really more of get back into the working field um, with additional support. Um, moving back to Salt Lake, there's not a lot of those type of um, charities or organizations. Um, here, it tends to be a bit more church oriented and that's just not my thing. Mm -hmm. So um, my daughter's like, you know, mom, I don't know why that disappoints you. You could, you know, there's the internet, there's so many other ways that you can reach people across sure. the country or across the, you know, all the way across the world if you want to. And so it, it really, she, she sparked my willingness because I was not a big social media person. Um, and so that piece was huge for me. And I stepped out first on social media, which was a lot to learn initially. And then, um, I've always listened to audiobooks and podcasts, so it's not new for me. I know a lot of people it's new, um, but I've always loved it. I listen to a lot. I mean, like a couple of my favorite. I love Tony Robbins too. He's another one that I would say through life has impacted me. Um, yeah. But, you know, listening to podcasts and I'm like, and of course my husband and I are both home. 
Um, I normally travel in my job about 80% of the time and I haven't been on an airplane since early March last year. So being home for me, not just physically in my house, but just not traveling is a big change for me. Um, having more times time on my hands and my husband having a background of music and audio, I'm like, we should do a podcast. So it, it started with that socialization piece and then morphed into, I had always said, if I'd ever write a book, it would be called leaving nowhere. And the reason it would be called leaving nowhere is because of all those people in my life that thought based on my circumstances that I was going nowhere were wrong. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> doesn't surprise you. I'm sure after hearing my story, but is, is it out there? Do we have that to look, yeah. to look for? Yeah. Yeah. It's out there. So leaving nowhere, not the book, but, but, but the oh. podcast. And so it's leaving nowhere, all roads lead to success. And again, it's really that piece that, um, you know, a is, is it's whatever you define success as whatever makes you happy. And then recognizing that no matter what the adversity is that you have to overcome, um, you will find success through Lowe's learnings. Um, may not feel like it at the time, um, recognizing that it didn't feel like it at the time for myself either, but but really the long term of what where that leads you. Um, so that I, I really wasn't certain what it would look like, feel like, sound like. It was like, let's just go, as most of us do um, when we start a podcast. And, you know, I, I've you know, I go back and forth between a couple of different types of ep- episodes. So I have a very short bonus where it's like every week I give a motivational Monday tip and I speak to a listener question or tip. So I'm sharing listener um, advice. Mm-hmm. Then I um, rotate between kind of a teachable, um, shorter episode where it really, it's just solo with myself, um, teaching out a life skill. And then, um, the longer episodes are more the interview based, um, episodes where I'm bringing people that want to share their success stories. So, um, that's where it's morphed into and, and really the basis of it or how I look at guests or the kind of the criteria that I frame it up with is, um, on my, on my website. So at candacewilly.com, um, on the podcast page, there's the 10 guiding principles for leaving nowhere. So those are really um, pieces that had I written a book, I would have formulated the outline on if, and those 10 guiding principles in no particular order are self-worth, vision, direction, values, choice, consequence, education, connection, and transition. So if I were to summarize, summarize how I was able to looking back at all of those scenarios, there is something that I could tie um, in those situations to every single one of these 10 principles that helped me overcome it. Well, there are your book chapters for the book. There you go. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you already have that outlined, yeah? Yep. <laughs> now I just got to get all the other stuff in it. <laughs> Only problem He's is I'd rather, okay. t- I, but I'd rather talk, rather talk about it, it than yeah. write it. <laughs> I, I see. Yeah, I hear you. Well, I'm told that, you know, you can just get your podcasts uh, digitized. I mean, so that uh, t- uh, transcribed into speech, a book. speech. Yeah. To t- yeah, that's the word transcribe yeah. that one. Yeah. 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 Well, my only concern is I'm not sure my sarcasm would translate. <laughs> so, oh, <laughs> well, then you have to use that. Thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. I say so many goofy things. I have to be careful because I, I probably live on the edge of annoying somebody every single day. Uh, however, <laughs> I just, they just have to take me being lovable as understanding that I'm not trying to do that to them, you know? No, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so There's cool. a superpower in that, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I keep looking for it. I keep looking for it. We'll work that out. Yep. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Great. Well, is there anything that, go, oh, go ahead, Kelvin. I, no, I was just going to steal your question. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, um, is there anything uh, that, you had hoped to talk about that we haven't gotten to. I guess no, no, you guys, this is great. 
You're good at what you do. I listened to some of your podcasts. I was like, I'm oh, excited to talk to these guys. I like oh. how, just honestly how genuine and authentic. And I was like, I can do this podcast. I'm ready. I just want to talk to these guys. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Because <laughs> we, Thank me, you. Rick asked, he's like, are you going to prepare? I'm like, nope, I'm just going to get on there and talk to them. So <laughs> awesome. Great. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, we do our little bit of research to you know make sure that, you know, we understand a little bit about who you are and what you can talk about, but you know, we don't, we don't sit here with a list of questions. So no, uh, we that. like the, you know, we, we like having the conversation. Rather than I tried that once he wouldn't let me <laughs> <laughs> no questions. I can't even write down seeds. We just have to listen. So the other thing in the podcast is I actually have to pay attention. Yeah, yeah, I got to yeah. pick out what to what to answer from, and and yeah. he and I have different. He's way more the analytical. Um, yes, Kel, Kelvin. Kelvin is the head. He stays in the clouds. I, I, I'm the feet. I stand around. We're, we're good. We're, we're can, very tall between us. Yeah, that works, that works I can that see way, that yeah. dynamic, and it works for you. Yeah, yeah. no, it's good. We balance it out. Well, and, you know, I'd share with you too, the other funny thing about podcasts and, you know, I, I had to hold back from not answering it this way because that's not where it originated, but I, I laugh a little bit about podcasts right now because if I'm assuming um, now seeing you guys thinking about um, if you, you recall the 80s, which I, I, you know, my favorite era, favorite music, all that stuff. Yeah, I, I um, recall the 50s and the 60s too. Uh, <laughs> it's like, nah, nah, nah. Well, nobody, nobody, <laughs> nobody's counting. But my my correlation, <laughs> my correlation to the 80s is if you remember in the 80s, it didn't matter who you asked, they were either in a band, starting a band, or were dating somebody in a band. And nowadays, <laughs> when you bring up podcasts, it's like, oh, I'm going to start a podcast, or I have a podcast, or I'm dating somebody who has a podcast. Yep. I'm like, I'm like, I cannot for one. I just can't tell people I have a podcast anymore because they're like, oh, I'm starting a podcast too. I'm like, awesome. So I have flashbacks yeah. to the 80s. I'm like, Whoa. I hear you. Well, you know, the nice thing about and it, worst, here I am in, in my garage, just like oh, everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, the cool I thing about a podcast, really... and I've talked to a, a number of people who wanted to do podcasts and they weren't sure whether they wanted to do it. And I said that the, the nice thing about a podcast is the audience is yours. Yes. People aren't, people are coming to that podcast for you. So you can believe when you get an audience, when you got, when you got a following, there are people who are genuinely interested in what you yourself have to say. So, you know, you're not splitting it through some syndicate thing. People are coming up to hear you. And with data, you can figure out at least where they are, if not who. So <laughs> that's true. That's it's true. So, that's very yeah, true. Even, yeah. even people with some of the strangest things to discuss can have a following because yep. they're out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know what? It's so yeah. true. And I, I mean, I'm such a connector people, people wise. And, you know, I, I, I love that people are doing it. And, and of course it's such a, I mean, it is the future. It really is. People are invested in it. People want to tell their stories. People want to hear their stories. You know, I think it's a fantastic thing. And it, and again, touches everybody. I we have we have one, and my husband always references. It's like, oh, good downloaded. Frenchie's got our download. Somebody in France <laughs> listens right. to every episode. There you go. But um, you know, it does. It feels good that, and you bring up such a good point. It feels good that you're you're connecting to those people in your way, and they are coming for you. So right. I love that. So. Awesome yeah, guys. Well, yeah. I thank you. And very well. anything that you, anything else you want to know? My favorite color? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, where do you, where do you hang out most on social? Where can people find you? Instagram um, is where I tend to um, spend most of my time. So, so follow me on Instagram, Candace Willie. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. We will, uh, is a lot I'm of waiting fun. for you guys to dominate and take over the world, guys. All right, I'll be I'll be here waiting for that bamboo. To <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hopefully, we won't make you wait too long. Um, <laughs> if we do, it's probably my fault. So Josh will have to come out with that that uh, reminder thing. He does so <laughs> I know it's like awesome, guys. Well, thank you again for having me, and you know what, just. Wish you both much happiness and much success. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. We'll shoot you uh, an email when this is up. Awesome. Cool. Right. Thanks, Take guys. Care. Take All care. Right. Right. Thank you. Bye. You too. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening to show notes and more at JK
awdpodcast.com. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a review, and share with your friends, and we will see you next week. Bye! A Better Human Hood Production.